I don't know. That's just what pedestrian average mediocre receivers do. What's up? What's up? My man Deion Sanders, we alright, huh? We alright? Yeah, we alright. We don't go into the Super Bowl again, being alright. You're listening to the Pedestrian Podcast, the official UK podcast for the Seattle Seahawks. Here are your hosts, Ross Bell, Stuart Court, and Adam Nathan. Go Hawks! Welcome back to another episode of the Pedestrian Podcast. The off-season is slowly turning, the wheels are slowly turning on the off-season for the Seahawks with the playoffs in full swing with AFC and AFC conference games this weekend. But with all the coaching carousel in full swing in Seattle, with me, myself and Adam, I've reconvened. How are we, Adam? I'm not bad. It's quite nice to be uh, fairly compasmentous for this show because having <laughs> thought back to what we talked about last week in the midst of some of the worst man flu ever seen that I was suffering from. I realised I have absolutely no idea what we discussed, so obviously the day and night nurse was uh, working a treat, but uh, I'll probably end up repeating stuff, but I'm sure the listener won't mind that too much. No, no, no. no I, don't, I, I can't remember it, and I was fully fully with it, I think. Uh, but yeah, joining myself, uh, uh, collecting hat-trick ball, I believe, or maybe it's a, a quadruple appearance, uh, BBC Radio Sheffield, and the, the man behind Seahawks draft blog, uh, Rob Staten. How are we, Rob? Yeah, really good. Wish we were, wish the Seahawks were still playing, of course. Yeah. But um, but yeah, at least we get to talk about offensive coordinators and defensive coordinators <laughs> instead, because that's just that's just as fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, we, we we really want to miss out on Stefan Diggs lighting up Minnesota on Sunday, <laughs> didn't we? Yeah, well, well, what a game that was. That was quite. I was. In, was it four lead changes in the final three minutes? Wasn't it? Mm. Some that, some stupid. Uh, but yeah, obviously, since last time we spoke, Adam, I know you can't. Obviously, you can't remember. The Seahawks have hired the coaches they fired last week. So before we get into that, though, Rob, how what, what were your thoughts on how the season ended? It was a bit of a damp squib at the end of it, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, and I, I hate to say, but it felt, kind of felt like halfway through the season that it was going to go that way. You know, ten yeah. wins, nine wins. You, you just had a feeling of being that type of, of year. Nothing was really going right. Um, when you get to halfway through the year, and the running game still what it was, and then it just never really improved. It never got going at any point. When the injuries started happening, I think it was after the Arizona game when they lost Richard Sherman and Ken Chancellor for yeah. the season in that same game that you kind of felt like. This isn't going to happen this year. You know, you just, they've just lost so many players, just so many things that aren't right. And then, um, you know, what a fitting way to end the season, that having found a way to come back against Arizona and you think, well, at least they're going to finish with a victory. They're not going to get in the playoffs, but they are going to win the last game. Blair Walsh shanks another kick and, and the season's over. So, um, yeah, it was it was a major disappointment and I'm not surprised that we've seen major change uh, from Pete Carroll since. No, yeah, it's, it is. It, no, it really wasn't a surprising way to end, was it, Adam? But yeah, uh, the Seahawks uh, have moved to hire new offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, and a few position coaches as well. The first name which came out, I think, uh, Friday or Saturday of last week, was the former New York Jets uh, OC and former uh, Georgia OC, and the guy who spent 2017 season as a quarterback coach in Indianapolis, Brian Schottenheimer, was hired as the team's offensive coordinator. This is all just a return to run the ball and just getting that back on track after a down year or two, isn't it, Rob? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. I think this is just Pete Carroll essentially bringing people in who are going to try and deliver on his very defined identity. You know, one of the problems the Seahawks had when Jim Mora was in charge, you know, that sort of period between Holmgren and Carroll was that it was really hard to work out exactly what Jim Mora's vision was for the team, what his identity was. And then Carroll yeah. comes in and he laid it out, you know, immediately, this is what I want to do. This is what we're going to do. And you could see it in place within you know, 18 months of him being in charge when they finally got halfway through that um, 2011 season and Marshall Lynch was running, they were playing physical defense. You could see the only thing they were missing was a quarterback and then Russell Wilson came along. So the last two years, they've not had that. The running game has been miserable. The defense has regressed a little bit. You know, that the injuries, have, of course, have played a big part in that, but they've just not reached the same standards that they had in the past either. Um, and they need to get back to it. And I think Carroll wants certain players held a little bit more accountable. And it's hard to do that with the same same faces, same voices um, in charge in terms of the key assistant positions. Carroll has stayed. You know, he's not moved on. So he clearly feels like... He needs to change the people beneath him. And I think that Schottenheimer coming in is a guy who's very dedicated to the running game. And, um, you know, I think Rex Ryan told the story 
a few days ago that, you know, if, if he said to run it 40 times when Schottenheimer was the Jets offensive coordinator, then he would run it 40 times. So that's what uh, I think Pete Carroll's looking for. Yeah, and in, in Schottenheimer's one year as the Georgia Bulldogs OC, they averaged 37 rush attempts per game with uh, Nick Chubb, Keith Marshall, and a selection of other running backs. Adam, your thoughts on Schottenheimer? I don't necessarily have any thoughts on him as an individual because I don't know enough about you know, the statistics and whatever, but I think the what you can certainly tell by all of the changes this week are Pete Carroll has wrestled control back of the team and this is now 100% his his baby again. I mean, from, from all accounts, if you, you know, reading in between the lines, it seems like there was, you know, a couple of coordinators that not exactly doing things um, exactly the way he wanted them to be. Uh, and I think certainly from an accountability point of view right now we know that if it works out or if it doesn't work out I think it's pretty squarely on Pete Carroll but it does did make me laugh a little bit that last week he was talking about you know we've got to be respect these guys because they got families and then you know fast forward a week he reminded me of Michael Corleone being uh, becoming the godfather to, to the child renouncing <laughs> Satan and all of a sudden you know uh, Mo Green's being shot in the eye Clemenza doing people when they're in their bed I mean it, it was like he was purging uh, the Seahawks of all the bad things and sort of uh, you know, bring it in house and and becoming the, the Michael Corleone Godfather boss of the team. If that's not too ridiculous an analogy, which it almost certainly is. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of got lost halfway through uh, that <laughs> that uh, analogy. Obviously, along along with Schottenheimer, along with possibly the return to the run game, the team also hired uh, Mike Solari. Solari, who spent 2017 as the airline coach for the New York Giants, had previously spent two years as the offensive line coach uh, in Seattle. Uh, I think he was the final year of Holmgren and the Jim Mora year. But the hiring of Solari along with Schottenheimer is just further emphasises the want to ret- to get the, the run game going again, Rob, again. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and the other thing that I thought was really interesting about these appointments is they all kind of feel relatively immediate and short term. There's no appointment of a young upcoming coach. No. You, you could be an heir apparent. There's no assistant. As far as I'm aware, there's no assistant head coach that's been named. You know, the two that were there, you know, Michael Barrow, the linebackers coach, was an assistant head coach. So was uh, Tom Cable. There's nobody being put on a platform level with Pete Carroll. This is essentially his show. He's brought people in beneath him who either he's familiar with or he's familiar with the style that they, they want to, to incorporate on either side of the ball, um, or it's it's people who he's worked with and, and know his system and his way of doing things. So it, it just seems like, uh, do you know what? This is my show. I'm going to go out on my terms. If we're not going to win another title in the next couple of years, then I want it to be on me, not on the coordinators. It's going to be my identity. It's going to be my vision. We need to get back to that. Um, it's not the most exciting set of hirings you know I think that the reaction from fans has probably been slightly underwhelming but um, Carroll's doing what he thinks he needs to do to as as was mentioned there you know to establish control and to get back to his way of doing things so we have to wait and see if he can do that because they've been a long way off uh, doing the things that he wants to do for the last couple of years yeah and as a, sorry as a gut feeling Rob what do you think about the maybe the workability of a system that Carroll wants to put in place. I mean, I've always slightly worried that he's turning into a bit of an Arsene Wenger of, of the NFL and sort of saying so true to a style that is perhaps becoming a little bit passe. Do you think the way he clearly wants to set his team up is a way that can still win in such a, you know, such an ever-changing league? If you'd have asked me that question about seven weeks ago, then I probably would have agreed with you or at least sort of had a lot of sympathy for that point. Because you were seeing teams like the Rams, for example, and the success that they were having. The Rams will, will play a bad team and they'll be 20-0 up at the end of the first quarter and the game's over. And that's and that's how a lot of those teams are winning. And you look at, the, you know, obviously the Patriots and the Steelers and the highly charged, powerful offences, a lot of spread systems sort of lending um, schemes and philosophies from the college game. You, you see that. And yet here we are and we're watching four teams left in the playoffs and one of them's quarterback by Nick Foles, and they run the ball well and they play good defense. One's by Case Keenum, who's had a fantastic year, but they still run the ball and play great defense. We've got the Jacksonville Jaguars, who've got Blake Bortles, who played great defense and run the ball. And that is almost a perfect illustration that what Carroll is trying to do can still succeed. And maybe is it, it, it's it's maybe that the Rams might win the NFC West for the next two or three years because of their talent, and their ability to sort of beat the bad teams, which is something that Seah- the Seahawks generally tend to play down to teams. So they keep, they allow bad teams to stay in games longer than they should do. The Rams, I don't think are going to have that problem. 
So the Rams might win the NFC West for the next two or three years. If the Seahawks get into a wild card, though, they might be a, the tougher team in the playoffs because it certainly seems that running the ball and playing great defense is still the thing that wins championships. So I, I think that seeing the three of the four teams that are left in the playoffs is actually quite encouraging for the way Carroll wants to play. Yeah, and also with that, how the Rams season ended against the Falcons and with Dan Quinn, that's sort of what they, how they approached that game in Los Angeles. When they ran the ball with Freeman and Coleman and shut down Todd Gurley, both pass and run game, didn't they? That kind of yeah, yeah, well, emphasises that. Watching that game, they they set out to stop Todd Gurley, or to not to stop him, but to limit Todd Gurley and try yeah. and put the game on Goff. And Goff was not up to to winning that contest. And if you watch all of the Rams' losses, it's almost they're almost identical versions. You know, they lost to Washington at home, they lost to Seattle at home, um, they lost to Philadelphia at home. And these were games where it was actually put on Goff to try and keep up and match up and, and be this sort of big franchise quarterback, and he can't do it. Todd Gurley is their is their key to victory. And if you play strong defense and stop the run and make him try and beat you, that's that's. Goff isn't up to that right now. Maybe he will be in a few years, but right now he isn't. And I don't, I'm, I'm not confident that he's ever going to get to that level. And then if you can make enough plays on that defense, great up front as they are with Aaron Donald and co, not as great on the back end. If you can make enough plays there and you can keep the scoreboard ticking over, that Falcons win was very similar to Seattle's win when uh, when they won in LA, at least into that first half, first three quarters. Um, and, and that is the, the way to, to beat teams like the Rams. And I think that the Rams, like I say, will, will blow away bad teams but might struggle against the teams that are able to limit Todd Gurley and play defence. Yeah, uh, Adam? Yeah, it would be very upsetting times for Michael Silver again, which can only be <laughs> de- delighting, de- delightful for me to read about that. Um, yeah, and So the Todd Gurley thing, I'm just going to segue slightly into something that Seahawk Twitter has been a bit of a buzz about, and sorry if I'm taking this off schedule a little bit, Stu, but the importance of the running back itself. I mean, you you've been embroiled in loads of conversations about this recently rob whereby um a lot of people are saying that the run game just doesn't even matter and and certainly what doesn't matter even more is the running back that you've got that's doing it and people will give you stats about fournette versus the other jacksonville guys and elliot versus the other cowboys guys you don't subscribe to that view and we had nathan ernst on sort of being anti-rush but i'm interested to hear your view because i think i side with you sort of probably more than, than the other side of things. But I think it's always good to get both sides of it. Listen, I enjoy reading some of these pieces and there's definitely some methodology and, and some accuracy in what they say. And if you break down the numbers, the you know, passing efficiency is very important. Um, the thing is, though, is I, I just think that there is a real danger among Seahawks Twitter. And I think this is kind of infested and, and has grown and more and more people have latched onto this. It, it's just become too much. It's become, um, you know, football is not a maths quiz. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you can't judge everything based on what a set of numbers tell you. And if you, I'm sure if you put the numbers into the system and said, why are Jacksonville doing well? Nothing will tell you it's because of everything that Blake Bortles has done. Mm-hmm. Or that maybe Blake Bortles has had one or two or three important games where he's been able to be efficient. But, I mean, that wasn't the case against Buffalo um, in the wildcard round. It may have been the case in Pittsburgh, but it wasn't the week before. So I, I just think that you've got to it, to, to look at, at just numbers and say that passing is the only thing that matters or that running backs don't matter or that, well, you know, Todd Gurley, why would you draft him? Why would you want someone like that early on when you could just find someone in the sixth round who can do this? I think he's just being a little bit ignorant of not only what we're seeing in the playoffs right now, and a little bit silly and a bit over the top with regards to the really talented. I think a, I think a, a good running back. There's, there's nothing better than watching your team with a really good running game and a top notch uh, running back in the in the backfield. It's just it's just fun to watch. Mm-hmm. And that, what I don't understand about some of these Seahawks fans is. I'm presuming they've lived through most of the Pete Carroll era and have been Seahawks fans during the Pete Carroll era. Well, how important was Marshawn Lynch to this team? <laughs> you know, he was a first round pick. I know that the Seahawks got him for a bag of balls when they traded him from Buffalo, but that, that's, the, that's the Bills problem, not the Seahawks problem. The Bills spent a top 15 pick on Marshawn Lynch. And the, and the question I would have for a lot of these guys is, if Marshawn Lynch was there in round one this year and was sat there at number 18, would you pass on him? I mean, are you, would you pass on him because there's someone in the fifth or the sixth round that you'd rather have? And, and would that do more for the Seahawks than having Marshawn Lynch in the first round? So, look, I understand the, the passing efficiency. I, I appreciate the numbers. But, you know, I just think that there's a real danger that football is not maths. It's not always a base, based around stats. 
There's a reason why three of the four teams in the NFL are playing great defense and running the ball. And there's a reason why a coach as good and as successful as Pete Carroll still buys into that philosophy. Yeah, so and that... slightly play a bit of devil's advocate, and as I say, I, I agree with you first and foremost. I guess, could the argument be made that the Vikings drafted Dalvin Cook and actually his absence hasn't made that much of an impact and they can still run it? So maybe it's the, the scheme of running as opposed to the personnel. I mean, is, is that partly valid? Well, let me turn it on its head then. They spent a first-round pick on Teddy Bridgewater and they traded a first-round pick on Sam Bradford and yet Case Keenum, who they got off the street, is helping them win at quarterback. Very true. Yeah, very true. Like it. Someone's asked you that before, I reckon. <laughs> they haven't, no. Oh, very good. That's, <laughs> That's very good. Time. <laughs> so, obviously, the other uh, major coaching change came on the defensive side of the ball with Chris Richard effectively put on gardening leave for a few days while they sorted... Ken Norton's contract out in San Francisco and brought him back after two seasons as the DC down in Oakland. Um, first on Norton, though, it's, it's, I mean, while Pete Carroll's in the building, it's always Pete Carroll's defence. And as someone on Twitter referred to it, he just needs a joystick to run it, doesn't he, Rob? Well, yeah, I think that's, I've, I've read that comment from Bucky Brooks, and it, it. Maybe, it's a, maybe it's a tad disrespectful um, yeah. to, to Ken Norton. But I, I, I found... It, I don't know what you guys thought. I thought it was it was interesting. You kind of look at it two ways. One, I'm really happy that Ken Norton's coming back because I like Ken Norton. Who doesn't like Ken Norton? And sort yeah. of seeing him on the sideline shouting, you know, got three minutes for your damn life and all that when they were playing the 49ers is, you know, just sort of having that guy back on the sideline and seeing the reaction from people like Bobby Wagner and, yeah. and others, say, you know, how happy they are that Ken Norton's back. You know, it, it's a really, I, I think it'll be a popular hire in that regard. But at the same time, you do wonder, you know, why hasn't Ken Norton ever been given a defensive coordinator job before? He's worked with Pete Carroll for a long time, and Pete's appointed about five or six different defensive coordinators <laughs> at USC and Seattle and overlooked Ken Norton every time. And yet at the very very end of, of his career, you know, or that, that, you know, that's, a, that's an assumption that I think you could make with, with some, uh, some confidence, he's now turned to Ken Norton. So I, I think what it does is it, it shows that Pete's going to take even more control this year and that Ken is is probably not going to do that much of the scheming. He might not quite have the same role as, as Dan Quinn, uh, Chris Richard and, and Gus Bradley, and might be there just to do what he does really well, which is to motivate, inspire, and and get this physical toughness back on that defense. Yeah, like a good cop, bad cop kind of yeah, thing, isn't bit. it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what, what on, on the other side of that is Chris Richard, who's, for me, was slightly unlucky to be... Fine. Obviously, yeah, he missed Richard Sherman, no Cam Chancellor, no Cliff Avel for most of the season. And the defence, apart from a couple of lapses, obviously the big one coming against uh, the Rams. Um, did, uh, how, how, how do you think they handled all all that with Chris, Chris Richard? Obviously, earlier today, he put out a statement where Pete Carroll was not mentioned, which has <laughs> caught the attention of a few people. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah. Um... I, it's it's really hard. I mean, how do you how do you fire somebody in the right way when you've worked with them pretty much since they're in you know a college player? Yeah. Uh, Pete Carroll's probably known Chris Richard <laughs> maybe as long as as anybody is sort of known Chris Richard really, and um, in in terms of his professional career, and then to to, to have to fire him um, when he probably thinks not unfairly what a hand I was dealt this year, you know, losing so many key players yeah. um, and and the offence not being... I mean, look, think of the first sort of five, six games. The offence didn't do anything in the first half for, for weeks on end. And then... Um, and, and the pressure was always on the defence. Think of the Green Bay game in the first game where the defence played pretty much the entire first half. Mm-hmm. Um, and and he probably thought, you, you're blaming me for that. You know, how... How was I supposed to put together a great a great defense? And then you and then we lose so many players, Cliff and Cam and Richard Sherman and Earl Thomas was missing for time again, and Bobby Wagner and KJ Wright missed missed time. So he probably feels a little bit hard done to. And but yeah. Pete Carroll possibly feels like and obviously I, I don't know I don't know if you guys have any insight. I, I, it's something maybe. Chris Richard wanted to do things a certain way and Pete Carroll wanted to do them another. Maybe he felt that Chris Richard wasn't sticking to certain game plans or maybe he gave him a, you know, a lot of rope and he, he found that Chris Richard wasn't doing what he wanted him to do and he just wanted to take more control and, and felt like he had to make it. I mean, they went to Gus, Gus Bradley first. They um, <clears throat> spoke to the defensive line coach about being the defensive coordinator as well. I think it was about getting somebody with Pete who he knew and then Pete maybe 
sort of taking charge of this defense um, for at least 2018 anyway. Yeah, Adam? Yeah, I'm not sure whether you guys agree or disagree, but I, I actually felt that I thought Rashad has sort of found a groove in the last five or six games. I mean, one of the reasons that Seahawks used to be so fun to watch is that they were as enjoyable to watch on offense and defense. And I found that against Philadelphia and against Dallas, you know, the way they were you know, being much more creative with blitzing, I, I found it really fun to watch them on both both sides of the ball. Um, and, you know, looking at some stats, I think in the last four games of the season, so after the Philadelphia loss, I believe, the offense averaged 52 yards in the first half and they averaged three points in the first half of the last four games. I mean, it's pretty harsh to really hang anything on a defense when when the offense is that bad. Um, and the other thing I'd say is that, you know, the, the NFL media insiders, they're quite vulturous in the way that they, you know, pick at things for news. And I didn't find it the most becoming in the way that, you know, people seem to have their jobs replaced without any formal announcements. I mean, it's a minor thing. It's not, you know, Chris Rashard's not my uncle or anything. It's not like I should care about him particularly. But I didn't feel that things were done in the necessarily the right manner, um, if, if that if that makes sense. No, yeah. I, I, it's just all seemed a bit strange, a bit weirdly cloak, um, yeah, cloak, and, uh, cloak and dagger. But, yeah, um, it's, with, with, with all the hirings and firings, has it changed much for the Seahawks draft board moving in? Obviously, they don't have many picks as we as we sit here. But does, does it change anything, or to just reaffirm what you were thinking they were going to do anyway, Rob? Well, I think it kind of reaffirms what I thought they were going to do, which was to try and repair the running game first and foremost. I'm not sure, you know, it's very difficult to do that when you've only got one pick in the first two days of the draft, um, which probably means they're going to end up trading down again, which a lot of people will will probably pull a face out and, and think, oh, no, not again, because they've done that in the last few years and it hasn't really brought about great results in, in the second and third round. A few hits, but a few hits as well, and no, nobody of the kind of quality they drafted in the first two or three years. But they might have to do that because they just haven't got the draft picks um, unless they start trading you know, big-name players um, to, to get more stock. It, it just seems like an inevitability. And, and yeah, you know, the, the, the bringing in Solari, bringing in Schottenheimer makes me think that they are going to focus on the offense. They are going to focus on repairing the running game, whether that's O-line and running back. And they're probably going to bring younger guys onto the defense and coach them up, which is, I guess, Pete Carroll's speciality. Yeah, so it's... It... At 18, the running backs, um, obviously, take on Barkley's more than likely, unless he has a bit of a breakdown between now and uh, in the April, is going to be long gone. Who's, actually, Bryce Love has decided to stay at Stanford. Who are the names? Is it Ronald Jones at USC, or is, is 18 too early for him? It might not be too early for him, but I really like Ronald Jones. So I, I think that he's a first-round talent, and if you took him at 18 or 20 or 25 or whatever, I think it would it'd probably justify because I think he's so similar to Jamal Charles that if, you know, who wouldn't want Jamal Charles? Jamal Charles was a third-round pick when he was drafted by the Chiefs. But if you could go back in time, you know, and you do those those things they do on NFL.com and ESPN, you know, do a redraft type of thing, Charles would have been a yeah. top-ten pick. So, you know, I think that Jones is very similar, and if he ends up having a, the same kind of impact to the next level as, as Charles, then he's, he's definitely worth the first round pick. I just think that 18 is not a great... I think you can probably get some of these running backs later on. So, yeah. um, you know, I think that, as you mentioned there, Barkley's going to go in the top five. That's no, there's, there's no question about that. But then you've got Ronald Jones a second. You've got Kerryon Johnson. You've got Nick Chubb. You've got Sony Michelle. You've got Royce Freeman. You've got Rashad Penny. You've got Darius guys who I think is a little bit overrated but you've got all of those players who could go between anywhere between 20 and 50 so uh, you know in the in the next few weeks I think it's about finding out where you know identifying the one or two guys that you really really want and sort of trading back into a position where you, you can either take them or you take an offensive lineman first and then try and acquire a pick in either the late second or the early third round which enables you to to hit both positions. Yeah and also with, with uh, Sir Michelle and Nick Chubb of Schottenheimer was their coach Two yeah. years ago uh, in Georgia, I think so. Michelle had a thousand yard year as well. That's season. I think it was the year Trump got injured. Uh, but yeah, that's at, true. Yeah, but at 18, is, can the Seahawks, with obviously limited picks and a clear issue that the running game is, can they afford like a luxury? I mean, me and Adam asked you about Roquan Smith before we started recording. Can they afford a pick which would be a perceived luxury pick like Roquan Smith would be or another offensive player like an Anthony Miller wide receiver type? Or do they have to just stick to need at this point? No, I think they could take a defensive player. I mean, there, there are certainly, um, um, 
I, I like um, Roquan Smith. I also really, I think that Tremaine Edmonds at Virginia Tech's uh, going to be a fantastic player at the next level. And I think he's, if he was there at 18, I think you sort of, you sprint to the podium and you just take him and you feel very happy about that. And, the, and you just try and repair the running game in other ways. But I, I think he's probably going to go in the top 12 possibly top 10 so I don't think he's going to be there um, and with and I don't think Smith's going to be there either I think no. that a lot of I think a lot of the players that if you notice the three at Clemson Austin Bryan Christian Wilkins and uh, Clellan Farrell have all returned to school so there, there's two two or three of those players might have gone in a range where you know ahead of um, Roquan Smith depending on how they tested and now players are going to get bumped up as a consequence of that so Farrell may have been a top five pick would have been top 10 He's not there anymore. Everybody kind of shifts up one. And yeah. uh, Roquan Smith, I think he's probably going to go, you know, there's Miami at, I think, 11, Cincinnati at 12, Washington 13. If he gets past all three of those teams, I think it'd be a little bit of a surprise. But, you know, I, I've, I've, did, I've just done a piece today uh, looking at this sort of how many legit first round prospects there are. I, I, there aren't that many. I think there's, I personally think there's 11. And I think teams <laughs> will, that's, that's it. You know, and in a good year, you get about 20. Yeah. On average, it's about 15, um, and I've got 11 on, in my opinion, and I think that teams will probably be in that 10 or 15 range about there. Maybe some will have 16, 17 if they really like the quarterback class. So there aren't that many that at 18 that are going to last there, and you think I've got to take this guy. And I think that the best value in this draft is going to be early. The guy you're taking th- at 35, for example is probably going to be similarly graded to the guy you take at 20. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Adam? So from a general roster building perspective, when the season ended and coaches were probably going to lose their jobs, I sort of viewed this as probably going to be a down year coming with you know trading players away to get some picks for 2019 in conjunction with uh, quite a few compensatory picks that I imagine they'd got. But now looking at the coaches they've brought in, as you say, it all seems fairly short term. Do you think maybe that they're sort of thinking about, you know, putting the band back together for one final year to give it a real go, as opposed to maybe thinking about 2019 as, as the build, the year to properly rebuild. And could that maybe be sort of leave us in limbo for both years? I mean, I, I'm coming at it from a quite a pessimistic angle, obviously, but that's just the way I, the way I do sports as a fan. I think, um, I think it's somewhere in between. So I think there's going to be a, a bit of churn and some guys who will ultimately come back. So, I think it'd be very difficult to move Richard. They're not going to cut Richard Sherman. If if someone was willing to offer a second round pick, for example, they might think about it. But is anybody going to offer that with only having one year on his contract left and also he's coming off a serious injury? So I think that Sherman will come back. Um, Earl Thomas, it's really going to come down to his contract because he's a free agent in a year. So if he's absolutely determined either not to sign a new contract or if he wanted 15 or $16 million a year, for example, they're not going to do that. And they may feel like or he may threaten to hold out, for example, if, if they start thinking about franchise tagging a year. So if you're going to do that, do you maybe have to consider moving him just to get what you can now as opposed to only getting a third round pick in two years' time? That's one of the other things they have to consider. But I think Thomas will come back. I think they'll find a way to, to re-up his deal and, and keep him. Um, but then you look at other players. So I think that Cliff, I know he said that he's going to, he, he said on the NFL network he's going to try and come back and play. And then today when he was speaking to Brock and Salk, he's kind of stepped back from that and said, look, yeah. quality of life is the most important thing for me. And that's all I'm focused on. So he, to me, seems like he's, He's probably a player who really wants to play again, but maybe realises that he can't. And he's in, he's in a tiny bit of denial there and and sort of wants to, but maybe realises he can't. And I think that ultimately he will retire. Um, I think that Michael Bennett, one way or another, is going to go. I think they're going to move on. And, and I know people have said, how can you replace him? You're only going to say $2 million this year. But I think you have to look beyond that and say, yeah, OK, you only saved $2 million this year. But in 2019, his full $9 million is off the books. And if you wait 12 months to cut him, um, the saving next year is not much different. It, it's pretty similar. I think it's like one and a half extra million dollars. So if you're going to move on, move on now. You know, don't delay this. You just just, come, just get on with it. So there are two players. And then Cam, obviously, I think he's going to retire. I think that's pretty well established, despite what he was saying on Twitter, that he's going to retire. So if they do lose um, or move on from, from Bennett, Cliff and Cam, that is quite a churn. And then you are having to bring in younger players to sort of step up to the plate and replace those guys. So I think it is going to be a little bit of a churn. They are going to start that transition, but they will obviously keep some of the veterans. And I think we'll see KJ Wright, Richard Sherman and Earl Thomas still on this defence next year. 
What yes. about the three? Sorry, Stu. What about the three <laughs> sort of marquee free agent names that are going to walking out the door in Gray and Richardson and Richardson? Um, see, you know, spending cap money for maybe 2019 a, a real go. I guess that's a consideration for some fans for not wanting to to re up, even though we could probably do with all three of them uh, next season. I think Graham will move on. I think that he probably doesn't want to come back. I think I imagine that he possibly feels like he was. He, he didn't sign with the Seahawks as a free agent. They traded for him, and he went from an offense where he was putting up huge numbers with Drew Brees to an offense where they asked him to do things he, he knew wasn't really up to – it wasn't his best skill set, so like blocking, for example. So I kind of feel like despite the, the friendship he has with Russell Wilson and that, he probably wants to move on. The Seahawks are probably willing to move on there as well, so I think Jimmy Graham will go. Um, in terms of Sheldon Richardson, it's going to come down to cost. You know, Personally, I think he'll, he'll hit the market, and then it will be depend how much – he's being offered. So if he gets there and his market's a bit like Cliff Averill and Michael Bennett in 2013, then he could come back. For example, if teams are willing to give him eight, nine million dollars over two years or one year, maybe the Seahawks can find a way to bring him back. If somebody offers $15 million or, or 14, 16, that kind of range, then I think he probably moves on and they just take the third round comp pick that they're going to get. So I think that it's kind of flexible with Sheldon Richardson. As for Paul Richardson, it is a really good wide receiver group they're going to be hitting free agency you've got several big names in there and they're all going to be competing for for a, you know a, a, the same kind of money so you might see one or two or three get big contracts but you might see one two or three having to take one year deals and and go somewhere else and play for a year now paul richardson could be one of those who gets like a robert woods uh, type contract or he could be somebody who ends up having to play for a year and if people remember a year ago Olshon jeffrey had to sign a, a one-year contract and terrell Pryor had to sign a one-year contract and uh, Jeffrey's gone on to sign a major extension, and prior his just season's been a complete write-off. So I think we may see one or two players do that. So the question for me with Paul Richardson is, one, is he the type of player who comes back for a year and has another year in Seattle or somewhere else? Or is there somebody else out there, like a Marquis Lee or a Jarvis Landry or an Alan Robinson or you know somebody of that ilk who you bring in on a one-year deal, reasonable value, and you say, look, go and try and impress, and, and we'll, if you have a good year, we'll think about signing you as, he, as we did with uh, Bennett and Averill or you may want to go somewhere else and your market's a lot better do, with, with, with those three do you think the 2019 comp picks will have any say in the decisions they make obviously if they put a certain cap number on how high they go with the players do you think 2019 obviously it's a bit it's a bit uh, it's a bit of a way away but do you think because they're probably going to get third fourth comp- compensatory picks if they let those three or so if they let any of those three walk, aren't they? Do you not be a consideration? Or? You know what? That I, I think a few weeks ago, people kind of assumed they'd get a load of comp picks for these guys. But what is actually Jimmy Graham going to get on the open market? Yeah. You know, he's, he's probably going to need to get 10, 12 million to get a third, fourth round comp pick. And because the contracts are going up and because the cap keeps going up, you know, the teams that are going to, the, the players that get your third round comp picks now are going to be earning like 16, 17 million dollars. You know, it's, it's got quite ridiculous. And if, if Kirk Cousins was on the open market, and if um, Sammy Watkins is on the open market, and if Sheldon Richardson's on the open market, and, and several others, and Alan Robinson, and people like that, then it's going to be quite hard to see how Jimmy Graham, for example, even maybe even gets you a fourth round. I mean, some, someone might offer him $6 million for next year, which isn't going to get you a huge comp pick return. And for Paul Richardson, if he's in the same range, again, it's not. I don't think it's going to get you a really, really high pick. So um, Sheldon Richardson is the one that might, get you the best return he's he's because yeah. pro- defensive lineman and offensive lineman are in demand he's the one who might get you a, a third round pick uh, and if if, they, if he does it i don't think the seahawks are going to sign anybody for 13 14 15 million dollars mm-hmm. a year in, in the off season so if he ends up going for that then they'll get a third round pick yeah uh, adam no i think that's about it I mean, i'm just thinking about um some potential other drafting players and maybe i'm jumping ahead of touch but i've always had uh, a real love as for the player that Azeem Victor is and what with KJ Wright potentially moving on, um, is there any chance that he might be a sort of a late round guy for the Seahawks? Because I would just love to see him uh, staying in Seattle in the city. I think given the issues that he's had, uh, you know, he'd probably be somebody who's going to go undrafted or go in the very, very last round. So um, if that's the case and they will have good intel on him because the, the, the relationship between the Seahawks and, and Washington seems to be good. They'll, they'll know everything about him. They'll know if uh, he's, he's 
worthy of an opportunity at the next level. And yeah, I could definitely see him being someone the Seahawks have a look at there. I think it's a really good linebacker group, actually. I think if they wanted to bring somebody in in that range um, on day three, there'll be there'll be possibilities there. You know, if they trade back a little bit, there's there's players like Rashawn Evans, Lorenzo Carter, uh, Bieria at, at Washington. I think it's a really good player. You know, you've you've got a lot of players who could come in and offer some some nice young depth at linebacker. I, I think there's in terms of Seattle's biggest needs, which is kind of defensive front seven, whether that's D line linebacker, uh, running back an offensive line, especially in the interior. There's a lot of really nice options in this draft. It's it's kind of a draft that has been it, it's not got the greatest quality, but it's it's more or less tailor made for the Seahawks. So they should be able to get at least one really good running back in this, if not two, you know, take one early and maybe one on day three. They should be able to get a good interior offensive lineman if they want to add to the competition there. And they should be able to draft for the defensive front seven and for the secondary as well. So I think there's there's plenty of opportunities for the Seahawks to to come out of this draft uh, feeling pretty good about their situation, getting younger, getting cheaper at some key positions and, um, and starting that transition to, to sort of a new core. Yeah, uh, so league-wide, obviously, a lot of the attention lead up to draft will be, as it always is, focused on the quarterbacks at the top. People like Baker Mayfield seem to have shot up some draft boards. He's gone up in my estimation how he was in the playoffs. He was, yeah, he was one reason that the Georgia made it so made it so far and obviously almost won in the title game. Is he someone who could like set the cat amongst the pigeons in that first round? And as you mentioned earlier about people moving up one with Roquan Smith. And out of Seattle's reach is the quarterback positions one that could help the Seahawks have someone like that fall down to them 18. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's one problem though with the NFL, and you guys have probably noticed this as well, is that um, conventional wisdom is is still prevalent. <laughs> so, so for example, Baker Mayfield is probably about five eleven, six foot, and. Yeah. However well he played, and he was fantastic in it, you know, this year and won the Heisman Trophy. And you watch him play and you kind of see a little bit of Drew Brees, a little bit of Russell Wilson in there. And you think, how oh, this guy can play. And, and I kind of like his sparky personality as well. It doesn't put me off at all. So I'm thinking, yeah, what a play. You know, could go in the top ten. And then I remember, hang on a minute, though. You know, Russell Wilson lasted to the third <laughs> round. You know, teams will look at this guy. Here's the situation. Because Drew Locke at Missouri, I don't know if you've, you've seen him play. Yeah. He, he's not as good as Baker Mayfield. But he's like six foot four, 220 pounds, <laughs> does, you know, looks like a quarterback. So there was a chance if he chose not to declare, but there was a very good chance if he did that he would have gone ahead of Baker Mayfield and would have gone in the top 15 purely because he is the prototype. Josh Allen, for example, might be the number one overall pick this year. And, and I'd probably say he's probably like the fifth best quarterback in this class, but he might go number one because he's the most you look at him, oh, he's tall, he's mobile, he throws it downfield. You know, we can work with this. That's how teams, a lot of teams and a lot of their GMs and still very old school think about this situation. They probably think Sam Donald's a bit too creative, a bit, you know, he, he might go away from the game plan a little bit too much. You want someone who's going to go up there and do exactly what we tell him to do. And they look at someone like Josh Allen and think, we can teach him to do that. So that's, you know, Baker Mayfield is, is probably going to be a victim of, of sort of this conventional wisdom. And now there will be brave teams out there and there will be a, a team that eventually takes him. Um, but I, I, his talent's probably worth a top 10. He might end up going a lot later than that. I think I had him at 17 in my mock draft this week to, to yeah. L.A. to take him to, to work behind Rivers because I think that teams will just... The, the, it does conventional wisdom still does the NFL, and we're talking about Roquan Smith just quickly on that. He'll he'll find the same thing because you watch him play and you think, wow, this guy's a first round pick. And then I bet if you spoke to people within the game, they would say, yeah, but he's only six foot and two twenty pounds. <laughs> so they probably think he's too small to play middle linebacker in any three four scheme. And the teams that play four three will probably say, yeah, but he's at, he's probably got the size of a Sam or a Will. And we want him to play middle linebacker. That's his best position. And we he, he's probably too small for us. So yeah, we'll not think about that. Because Bobby Wagner is about 245 pounds. So there's, there's like a 25 pound difference there. And he's taller as well. So teams will actually end up... I mean, I've read stuff that says Roquan Smith, really, really good, love him, intense, flies around the field, makes plays, does all this. But his size um, could keep him out of round one. And uh, that's not going to happen. He's going to go in the first round. But he might end up going a tad later than he otherwise would do purely because of his size, which is ridiculous. Look at Deion Jones. Yeah. It's amazing. When I started watching the NFL, I thought it was such like a progressive and modern sport and in so many ways it is, but 
when you look at things, it's, it really is like a jobs for the boys league, you know, in the same way as like Phil Brown lost a South End job today, but he'll get another job in two months time because there'll be a team in League One or League Two that wants him. And it's funny that you talk about the conventional wisdom because it actually segues into something that Seahawk Twitter has been going on about that maybe our own quarterback is not the right guy to take us forward, which I find absolutely astonishing. That you, yeah. You know, once you spend your entire life looking for a franchise quarterback, in my opinion, when you get one, you cling on to them for dear life and retirement is the only thing that takes them away from you. Um, presumably, you're nowhere near the camp that suggests that Russell Wilson is <laughs> the guy that should be out the door. I mean, there is a fairly prominent guy on Seahawks Twitter who's really good, but just, I don't know, maybe he's just got a little bit emotional in, in, in the past few weeks and wants the, wants the quarterback gone, but presumably you're, you're not in that camp. Uh, no, not at all. I mean, the, the two big sort of problems I have with Seahawks Twitter, and not, look, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody in particular, but it is the relentless obsession with uh, the passing game versus the running game, and it is this sort of desire to knock Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson's not conventional, but Russell Wilson's probably one of the best 10 players in the NFL at any position. You know, he just he, uh, it's just incredible to watch him play. It's, it's, a, it's a privilege to be able to watch every single one of his NFL games. And do you know what? There are some plays where he drops back and he runs into a sack and you get really frustrated and you curse at the TV and you maybe throw something at the screen. Um, but then on the next set of downs, he will scramble away from trouble and do what he did against Arizona and throw it to Doug Baldwin, who was like, what, an inch away from a, the most impressive touchdown of the regular season. And you have to live with some of the little flaws that you have with Russell Wilson to have the extreme brilliance that you also get with him. And he did, I think he led the they led the league in touchdowns for the year. He was an MVP candidate, despite the fact that there was no running game at all. You know, he, he put up all of the production that he had, despite the fact that the only running back on the roster to get a touchdown was J.D. McKissick, and he's kind of like a <laughs> half running back, half receiver anyway. I mean, like, to do all of what he did this year with no support whatsoever in the running game, is incredible, and I, I I would be surprised if the Seahawks share those opinions on Russell Wilson. Can you rate him in a little bit? Can he do things a little bit differently? Are there certain scenarios where he can be better? Yes, but you could say the same about probably any quarterback in the league, including Tom Brady and, and Aaron Rodgers. There are little things that happen that you think, oh, God, he just missed that there, or he didn't quite do that play right, or he's not stuck to the play call there or whatever. Um, and Russell's no different. And I think sometimes we kind of seek perfection when perfection is incredibly unlikely. And Russell Wilson is far from a problem in Seattle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but talking of the quarterback position in Seattle, obviously the backup was a bit of an issue and a sore point during preseason. Um, is is that a position you see him taking a flyer, flyer on someone late? Or is that another like boiking situation with a drafted guy, do you think? And it, uh, are there any names that are standing out to you? three months before the draft who could fit that profile uh it's it's tough because i think with the the lack of picks that they've got you know spending one on a quarterback you always kind of want to take one and john schneider kind of said that when he came in and then he hasn't um but you, you do want to take one and develop one I, I think the only one that comes off the top of my head without sort of i haven't spent a lot of time on the the deep uh, the depth of yeah. quarterbacks this draft. But someone like Riley Ferguson, for example, yeah. might be someone that you could bring in and develop. Um, it was the quarterback at Memphis. Um, uh, apart from that, I think that the, the, there is some decent talent. I mean, there's, there could be five first-round quarterbacks, for example, this year, um, as long as teams don't get silly about Lamar Jackson, who I think you know fully warrants going in the first round because he, he's incredible. Yeah. Well, uh, Tom, yeah. F uh, Ferguson was the one who... When I asked that question, he was the one I was thinking of. He's, he's at the Shrine game this week, and he weighed in at 6'4 and £210, and someone mm -hmm. referred to him as having the Tom Brady body, which I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> well, look, he's good. And the, and the other guy that might be worth a shot, just because of the late round of that, it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea, but you know, like Luke Falk um, has got mm. something about him. It's, it's just that for whatever reason, and he did play for Mike Leach, so that might be why, um, <laughs> he... It just never quite had a, a full season, if you know what I mean by that. You know, it was never quite consistent all the way through. You'd see some games where you'd think, wow, look at this guy. And then there'd be other games where you think, oh, no, 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 no. You know, you, you can't draft him in the first two days. And if he was there, you know, in the back end of the draft, for example, if he lasted that long to take and sort of just have him learn the system and and and, and sit behind Russell and maybe down the line he would have, have some value to somebody else, 
that would be an option. But it, I must admit, it's not a position that I'm ever really going to focus on because the Seahawks haven't drafted one since Wilson, have they? So, no. uh, you know, the chances that they're going to do it this year in the middle of a transition when they're trying to get younger on defence and repair the running game is perhaps unlikely. I mean, I could give you a list of several players that I like for day three, but yeah. I, I, quarterback is not really a position I've focused on too much so far. No. Um, what, what about, uh, obviously we talked about Jimmy Graham leaving. Obviously Luke Wilson's also a free agent, although it seems mm. likely that he'll be back. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's, I think you said on Hawk Blogger last week, it's not it's not a position which has the depth that you say it has for a running back, for example. Who, who are the names that are standing out? Some of I've pointed Adam to is Dallas Goder or Goder, however you say his surname, uh, from South Dakota State. Is he someone who could be in the Seahawks uh, cross crosshairs come April? I hate to say, I, I mean, watched a bit of him. Um, I thought he was just a guy. And yeah. I kind of felt the same about Mark Andrews. Andrews, for me, just makes plays on the very easy routes. Um, I, I think I made the point to Hawk Blogger that if you watch Mark Andrews at, at Oklahoma, when they played Georgia, they ran one route and it made for like a 20-yard completion. They went back to it a few drives later and it led to an interception because Georgia saw it and they knew what to do. And the good teams will do that. And Andrews, for me, is not the kind of difference-making athlete. Goda isn't... Um, trying to think of the other names that are often get talked about Penn State Gisicki he's what yeah he's yeah just, he's, he's another one you know he's, he's big doesn't block at all and you know you just wonder how athletic he actually is we'll see at the combine because um, if he got test through the roof then someone will take him as like a glorified receiver but I think the Seahawks want blocking. I think that they've, they've lived for the Jimmy Graham experience. I think they want people who can block. I think they want people who can be more Zach Miller than Jimmy Graham. I think that we possibly will see Luke Wilson return because by the looks of things, Schottenheimer does run a lot of H-back stuff. So, you know, maybe instead of using the fullback, you know, that's the kind of role that Luke Wilson has done a lot um, over the last couple of years. So I, I can imagine him coming back and then I can imagine them possibly looking for finding somebody you know that like a cooper health let type something like that they bring in or like a really cheap free agent or even someone like austin Severian jenkins who seems to be uh working in the seahawks front office these days since he was championing marquis <laughs> lee coming back to seattle so maybe he's uh maybe he's destined to come back to seattle as well we don't know but i, I kind of see them going value and quite cheap at the position but with a very specific skill set which is first yeah. and foremost being able to block yeah. Is it fair to be slightly concerned about, just from a numbers perspective, where the touchdowns are going to come from in order to win enough games? Because if you, let's say that Jimmy Graham is going to leave, that's 10 touchdowns out the door. Let's say Paul Richardson isn't there, that could, that's probably six to seven six. touchdowns out the door. It slightly worries me that they're going to be heavily reliant on completely transforming that running game to get those touchdowns back. Because as far as I can see it from a receiver position, um, you know, teams did start to you know rush three and drop a few more into coverage against us, and we did struggle. And it concerns me slightly that if Doug Baldwin's taken out the game, have we got enough touchdowns in the roster to to really make a challenge? I think it's a really good point, and there's, there's sort of two ways that I think they might be able to combat that. The first thing is is that I think they have to do something at receiver, and they probably have to get a bigger target. Now, whether that is someone like Severian Jenkins at the tight end, he had like a three-game stretch where he was unstoppable in the red zone, and then for some reason the Jets kind of stopped using him there. Um, is he somebody who could come in and, and maybe not get 10 touchdowns or 11, but get five, for example? Is that an option? Um, is there a big receiver they could bring in to sort of offer some of the, the relief in the red zone that, that maybe Jimmy Graham offered there? That's another possibility. And the other thing that I would say is that I'd be, I think it'd be a more concerning thing if, they, if for example, they got like seven, six or seven rushing touchdowns last mm-hmm. year. But the fact that they only had one by a running back, it's, it's not beyond the realms of possibility to think that they might be able to get, for example, 11 mm-hmm. uh, rushing touchdowns next year if they get things. And that's not a, you know, Teams generally have about 10 rushing touchdowns, 11 rushing touchdowns. It's not a, it's not a stupid number. It's not like I've said 25 rushing touchdowns or anything like that. It's, it's like it's 10. It's 10 to 12. And if they do that, well, that's made up for Jimmy Graham's lack of touchdowns. And then it's just a case of replacing Paul Richardson's, which hopefully they would be able to do, whether that's with Lockett getting a few more, whether that's a big receiver, whether that's a replacement tight end, whether that's Luke Wilson, whether that's whatever it is, getting a few more than 10 rushing touchdowns. I think there is a a way to do that. I, I thoroughly appreciated what Jimmy Graham did for the offense. I thought he had 
a great year in the red zone and it transformed it stopped Seattle's red zone offense being a liability for the first time in years but at the same time I just wonder whether or not some of those touchdowns merely replaced the complete incompetent running game and, and the total lack of uh, production there with that you talk about the big body maybe a target I mean Stu and I have said for quite a few weeks now that and if this is probably not the way that you should construct a team but I, I would like to see the best defensive player left on the board taken at 18, assuming they, they stick at 18. Is there a receiver out there that is A, feasibly going to be there at the time and B, in your 11 guys that are worth a first rounder that, that could be potentially a guy that could be taken at, at that position? No, I don't. I, I think the best um, options a receiver are going to come on um, probably from around round three to round seven. I think it's going to be a good a good draft for, for receivers in that kind of range. And you, maybe someone like Javon Wims who had a really good year for Georgia, for example, or um, 